Good morning. Well, I just want to say that this side, flipping a little bit. Just saying, just saying. So there are some exciting things happening coming up uh, in this next week. So I want to bring your attention to it because I do not want you uh, to miss out. So um, on uh, Wednesday is Bible study. Don't miss it. We are going to be here. We are going to have a good time. We're going to have some great fellowship. Um, and so come out and be a part of that. On Thursday night, if you are free, um, around when does rehearsal kind of wraps up, I think around 7.30. Um, so at about 7.30 to 8, um, I need help kind of disassembling things for Friday. Um, so I'll need the chairs stacked up and put away and... Um, and anything glass taken away from the chapel area. So I could use some help doing that so that we will be ready for Free Fun Family Friday. All right? I am telling you, I am excited. Life-size Hungry Hungry Hippo. Life-size Aggravation. If you have never played Aggravation, it is a lot of fun. And you will need to come out and do it. And it is fun. Each one of you gets to be your own player on a team of four and you will have a nice little hat which will tell you what team you're on and you will move around that board we are going to play marbles anybody play marbles growing up anybody marbles are a lot of fun we are going to be playing marbles so we are going to have a great time at that then we're going to kind of clean up from that and then I invite you this is where you bring your friends who are really not affiliated with the church or are shirt-tailed affiliated with something that are looking for a place for their family to belong. This is going to be the third place. This is on one month, one Friday a month. This is where we are going to get together and just have great fellowship. This is where your children will have an opportunity to meet new people, to have an opportunity to really um, gather with good fellowship, good clean fellowship. So please be sure uh, to let everybody know. Bring as many people as you can. Share the word. Share it on Facebook. It is on our Facebook. Share it. Um, and I did correct it. It now has the date. And on in the back, uh, there is a flyer. I thought I just picked it up. I picked up everything back there. There it is. Here it is. I got one right here. Right here. So it looks like this. There's a whole bunch of them. Take them. And if you know somebody who has naughty children, put it on their thing. We accept naughty children. Go ahead. Put it there. Bring them and maybe we'll get some Jesus in them and make them not so naughty. So put that on their table. If you know of people who are always looking for something free to do with their kids, this is the place to be. So bring them out. And Kirsten is bringing her friends. They're bringing older people. So there are older people who are coming. So it doesn't have to be a group of four. Young adults, not old. Well, you know. I'm sorry. It depends on how, do you consider yourself young? I do still, until I work with the children in Children's Church, and then I'm like, I'm not young at all. So then we're going to do that. Then we're, after that's over, we're going to set up for quilting. If you are interested in quilting, here is your thing right here. Get some information about it. I will have the sewing machines. I will have the tables set up. And then if you are interested in coming, if you'll just sign up so I know that you're going to be here. So I know what, how many chairs to put out and how to kind of plan accordingly. But the first time is really going to be cutting your material because that is tedious. So we're going to be doing that. And these are the supplies that you will need. And then we are going to come back the next Sunday. And then the next day is what? It is family fellowship. It is feast for families. So this is the sign-up sheet. The church will be bringing meatloaf. So whatever goes with meatloaf. So in my house, oh, Terry says mac and cheese. With ours, it's with bacon. In our house, it's mashed potatoes and green beans. Always goes with, uh, except for the other day, it was, it was broccoli. It's not the same. Not the same. So sign up sheet in the back. Please be sure to do that. Now here's some things I am looking for for Free Fun Family Friday, if you happen to have them in your closet. I am looking for two furniture movers. Those are those flat things that have four wheels that go in all directions. It's a flat one. It's not a dolly. I don't want someone with handles. I just a flat thing. It's a little rectangle. Has carpet on one side, uh, on two of the bars usually. And uh, that's what I'm looking for, two of those. If you happen to have them, let me know. I have two at home, and uh, I'm needing two more. If you don't have any, I will donate to the church, but I just was hoping to find some. 
And then uh, I'm looking for four soccer balls. If anybody has four soccer balls. You have soccer balls? You have two. Be bring what you got, and I'll make sure you get them back. Um, we're just going to use them for something easy. And if anybody knows anybody who has ball pit balls, I mean, I can get 100 for $15 at, at uh, Target. That's fine, too. But I was hoping to find somebody who already had some ball pit balls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or I can get them for $2.99 from Timu, and I don't know. They might be this big. I don't know. And full of BPA, which is bad for you. I don't know. So anyways, and then we're going to start the week all over again. So I've got some exciting things coming up, except for the following Monday, uh, Joe and, um, and Pastor are going to be representing Living Word Church at the uh, New Life Golf Tournament. So go New Life. No, go Living Word Church. I get so confused. I have all these things in my head. And then, so we are going to have a great time. And then uh, Pastor uh, Terry and I and Mackenzie are going to go on vacation. But we will be back in time for the next Saturday. No, it's not vacation. It's my birthday. Okay, but it's still vacation. I mean, for me, I have to take it as vacation. I don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. So we are just going to have a great time. I hope that you will also. Um, have a great week, but we will still have activities. Bible study will still happen without us because Joe is has a key and he's going to do it. This week is your birthday on Thursday. Oh. October is a busy October is a busy month uh, in the Ray O'Dell household. So, um, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you uh, looking for anything in particular? So there is a phenomenon called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon. Um, it's also called frequency illusion or frequency bias. It's when you all of a sudden are, you decide you are going to go out and get a new car. And you have the only bright orange car in town. And then all of a sudden you see another orange car and another orange car and a northern orange. They didn't just buy them the same day you did. They've always been there. Or maybe you are become aware of um, Frenchie dogs, the Frenchie bulldogs, and all of a sudden now you're seeing them everywhere. It's not necessarily because you, they just all of a sudden appeared, but it's because you all of a sudden became aware of it, and it's on your mind. So my question is, what is on your mind? Is it joy? Is it misery? Because you know misery loves company. Boy, there's always somebody out there looking to bring you into their drama and to bring you down. And we sometimes will grab a hold of it and say, oh, me too. And before you know it, we are just down as low as they are, and we can't figure out how to get out of that pit because we didn't have our eyes where they needed to be. We need to keep our eyes focused on finding joy, that we can always find misery. There is, it's not a problem. It, there is not a shortage of misery and complaining. Uh, we can find it any time. But what we can always find is somebody who's full of joy. Boy, that joy, oh, joy makes us feel so great. Joy, I'm telling you, I didn't bring my pictures, but my things are blooming. I'm waiting, Joe, I'm waiting till they're all in bloom. Then I'll wait, and then I'll wait too long, and I'll miss showing everybody a picture. But you got to look for it, and every day I have pastor out there looking with, those, with me. And you know what? i got to tell you something. Not only, not only do I have flowers on my uh, my Mexican bird of paradise. I can't say the name of it because it's really long. Um, but on that one, but on my passion vine, I have two little passion fruits. They're like this big. And I am so excited. I don't like passion fruit, but I am going to watch it. It says it takes two to three months, so we may hear this whole story if something doesn't eat it out of my yard, um, possibly my dog. Um, so we have just, I'm just so excited. But we can find joy if that's what we're looking for. And the scripture says in Psalm 16, 8, it says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Yeah. You ever played Red Rover, Red Rover? You don't play it in school anymore because you might get hurt. But we used to play it in gym. And you always wanted to be near the strong hand person because it wasn't just your grip, but their grip was strong. You didn't want to be beside Mary Nelson because she was just like this. <laughs> and um, they just broke through. No matter how hard you held, you, had to, you just lost and you had to go to the other team and it was just silly. You wanted to be strong. 
with Christ at our, with God at our right hand, we will not be shaken. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus from whom our faith depends from beginning to end. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful, beautiful idea. If we keep our eyes in the right direction, we might find joy. Because if you go out looking for it, I promise you, you will find joy. And joy begins by getting together with fellowship with other believers. So don't forget about the activities this week. And the information will be on the back table. Finding joy. Yeah, I um, found a a podcast uh, from a doctor of happiness. I kid you not. Her name is Dr. Lori Santos. And she has a, a partner that does the podcast with her, Dr. Jamil Zaki. And they, uh, she is listed as a doc, the doctor of happiness. I want that job. She's actually a psychologist, but uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, to, uh, to listen to that, to find joy, to find happiness, to find uh, things that will uh, improve our lives rather than, uh, and bring us together rather than divide us and, uh, and separate us. Well, I want you to know that, that I have not lost my mind yet. There's, there's still a chance. Yeah. Uh, you're going to think that something's going on because today is going to sound like, as we finish Things Jesus Never Said, that series, it's going to sound like an Easter sermon. Uh, and that's, it's amazing for two reasons. One is that every time we have a message or a sermon, or, it should sound like an Easter sermon. Because we are people of the resurrection. We are Easter people. Uh, But also, I put this series together, what, six months ago when uh, when I was looking at some resources online with Life Church, and this outline really just kind of spoke to me. Well, this week just happens to coincide. The passage and the the topic uh, uh, coincides with the, the resurrection, with Jesus' crucifixion. Well, guess what? On Wednesday, when we do our Bible study in John, we're talking about the very same thing. Jesus last week on earth. So God put the timing perfect for these two things to come and happen at the same time. Now, we're studying John there. So I pulled my version from Luke so that, you know, Joe doesn't think I'm, you know, stealing his thunder. Uh, And I'm, I'm not, you know, God did this. It's not me. Don't blame me. Um, uh, but we're going to be looking at uh, things that we typically speak about at Easter. Now, that doesn't mean because we're Easter people and every Sunday we should be uh, focusing on the resurrection. It doesn't mean you can have Cadbury eggs every Sunday, Sharon, or, or stale peeps. That's what she likes, and stale peeps. I, I don't get it. Peeps are not good when they're fresh. It's, uh, no, it's just like a stale marshmallow with sugar on it. Ugh. It needs to have chocolate and peanut butter. But uh, this does fall right into who we are, who we identify with as Christians. Now, every week I try to start with things Jesus didn't say uh, that kind of flow into what we're talking about. So I want to um, tell you some fun things that Jesus didn't say about coming to churches, church on Sundays. Uh, first of all, he didn't say, blessed are those who wear bow ties and suit jackets, for theirs is the kingdom of God. doesn't matter how you dress when you come to church. God doesn't care what we look like on the, inside, on the outside. He wants to know what we look like on the inside, or he wants us to know what we look like on the inside. Now, in saying that, don't, you know, be sensible. I, I can... Be sensible, not don't be sensible. That didn't come out right. Here's another one Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, as often as you gather together, eat Boston cream donuts and drink great coffee. We don't have to do that. Jesus never said that because we're, we're not doing that in remembrance of him. We have communion, but, you know, that doesn't count as communion, so we don't have to do that. He also never said, come follow me, and no one will fight in the car on the way to church. You know, I bring that up because that's a real thing. I I saw that. That's why Sharon and I for decades have driven in separate cars to church. (laughs) It's just easier that way. 
That's why one Sunday morning, Sharon, driving to church with the three kids in the back when they were little, turned and rebuked the demons, the evil spirits, in the back of the car. And it seemed to have worked because they all got really quiet. Jesus didn't say that, however. You'll still have arguments on the way to church because you know who is focused on that? The enemy. He wants you, when you walk through the doors of the sanctuary of a church or when you're on your way to worship God, he wants you distracted, frustrated, you know, angry because the kids were, you know, kicking your seat as you were driving to church or being loud and obnoxious or, or looking at each other. And, you know, that's a big issue, too. Uh, so those are the types of things. But this morning, when we look at things that Jesus never said, we're going to look at guilt, basically. What do you deserve? Jesus, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I even forgot what... Oh, you get what you deserve. That's it, yeah. I don't focus on titles and, you know, that's all right. But do you battle feeling guilty? I think we do. I think there's a lot of guilt around. And when I did a search for guilt, it, it was interesting to me that the number one guilt in, in our culture is food guilt. We roughly feel guilty about 30% of the food that we eat. A third of the food that we eat. Well, most people, Joe, you, you eat too well for, you eat well enough for me. So that's why I don't feel guilty about it. 30%. And interestingly enough, the Google also said that, and, and it's true because it's on the internet, um, that, uh, that men, we tend to feel guilty for about 20 minutes and then we move on. Ladies, sorry, you feel guilty about food more intensely and, and for a longer period of time. I don't know why. I'm not going to comment on that because I'm just smart enough to know that won't end well. Uh, but that's between you and God, whatever that is. There's also other kinds of general guilt. There's Christian guilt that we don't pray enough. We don't support enough. We don't give enough. You know, I was thinking as, as I was watching uh, Janie nod at all the things that are going on, we'll just get an air mattress for you. So Friday, Saturday, you can just... Stay here. You don't have to worry about driving back and forth. Uh, you know, she lit up, and even Caitlin looked at her like, oh, no, when she talked about quilting. And I'm like, the only thing quilts are good for is sleeping under. Uh, anyway, uh, but we have that guilt, don't we, that we don't support enough. We don't attend. We don't pray enough. We don't read the Bible enough. Yeah, there's mom guilt. That was another one. It was kind of interesting. Uh, if it, you're, you feel guilty if you work and you're not with your kids. Then you feel guilty if you're with your kids and you're not at work. Or you feel guilty if you have that friend, you know, I don't know what you call her, that Instagram friend who's perfect, and they never miss a, a parent event or an appointment, and they always bring baked goods to it, and everyone loves, you know, you love her and you hate her. I know, that's mom guilt. Uh, there's, there's um, you know, and, and we, you know, Sharon feels guilty because she, she left one of our children, who happens to be back there, on her birthday at the theater. We forgot her. And it was a family thing. We took her to a, a movie on her birthday, and then we forgot her. I know. We feel guilty about that. And she's been in therapy ever since. Yeah, we drove separately there, too, for some reason, yeah. We have general guilt. We don't want to let people down, do we? And, uh, and so that means sometimes we can't say no because we don't want to feel guilty about it. We don't want to let them down even when we should say no. I feel guilty when I, when I leave our new puppy in the kennel all day long because I'm gone. I'm at work or whatever. I can't get home for lunch to let him out. I, I feel guilty when, when I fail. Sometimes we feel guilty when we fail, and then we feel guilty when we succeed, too. General guilt. You know, as a, as a father, sometimes I used to, I used to feel guilty because I wasn't spending enough time with my kids, with my family. And then I felt guilty because I, I wasn't at work. You know, we feel guilty when we work too hard, and sometimes we feel guilty when we take time off. I guess that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of guilt in there. There's pastor guilt, too. When I, don't, when I don't meet up to the standard that I have for myself and sometimes that I perceive that God has for me, I have guilt there. When I get upset and, and uh, 
say a bad word. Sharon tells a story about when we were first married and we were in Louisville, Kentucky, and we were trying to connect with some of the young adults. That's when we were young adults, Caitlin, um, in the community. And, and so we would invite, I would invite people over to our house. And, uh, and then when I was done, I would go to bed and leave Sharon with the people that were, uh, were there. And sometimes it was because they were boring and I was, you know, I wandered away. You know, I blamed it to ADD or something like that. Yeah, I was not, and I felt guilty about that years later. She actually, you know, and she would say to them after a while, she would just say, uh, they say, Where, where'd, where'd Terry go? And she says, oh, well, He's either tired or, or got bored and just went to bed. <laughs> she, would, she would tell them the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So I have, we all have guilt. There's plenty of guilt to go around. Uh, Sharon has what I call only child guilt. And that is, uh, we would get a letter when I was with the uh, Salvation Army that said, Gentlemen, you need to wear ties with your uniform at all times. And she would look at that and feel guilty about that. And I'm like, Sharon, you're not a gentleman, and you don't wear a tie. And I, if I wear a tie uh, or not, that's not your fault. That's something that you can't carry. But she has only child guilt, so the world revolves around only children. And when the rest of us learn that, it'll be so much easier for us. Luke 23 describes the last hours of Jesus' life here on earth. Now, I want to make sure, and we all know this, but I want to make sure I say it because we need to be reminded of it, that Jesus, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, instead of wearing a crown of, of gold and jewels, he wore a crown of thorns. Instead of, instead of being surrounded by, by servants, he was surrounded by thieves. Instead of sitting on a throne, he was hanging on a, on a cross. So in chapter 23 of Luke, verse 32 and 33, here's the situation. Two other men, say, say two. Okay, because that's going to be important. We're going to have a math question a little bit later and want to make sure you're paying attention. Two other men, both criminals were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him, Jesus, there, along with these criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So, here's the math question. As you're looking at that picture in your mind, how many people were hanging on crosses? Three. We, say it out loud. Three. Three, right. Jesus in the center and a criminal on either side. The two men who were criminals, and Jesus. Two plus one equals three. Okay, good, we got that. Now, and we understand how horrible crucifixion is, right? Did you know the word excruciating, excruciating pain? Ex meaning from, and cruci cruciating means cross. So when you say someone is going through excruciating pain, it's really saying it's pain, the pain of the cross. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. First of all, in this situation, the Romans would, would scourge the criminal. That means they take a whip, and it's not just a whip. It's a whip with rocks and glass and spikes on the end, and they would whip the criminal, the accused, 39 times. And you can imagine, if you saw Mel Gibson's The Passion, you, you know what that does. It tears the flesh off their body. It, it, you know, your organs would be exposed and you would, you would be so weak from loss of blood. It's a horrible way. That's step one. The next thing is that they put you up on the cross and they take roughly seven-inch spikes through, not the palm like we used to think, but through the wrist and through the tops of the feet, and they put the feet on top of one another. And then they jam that cross into the ground. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals or slaves. It wasn't for petty crimes. And 
In, <clears throat> in order to do a crucifixion, the Roman government had to take four soldiers and pay them 24 hours a day to watch. And sometimes it took as long as four days for a criminal to die uh, through crucifixion. It was the most horrible death physically and spiritually. You know, there's that, the Bible says that, that those that die on the tree are cursed. And the tree, of course, referencing the cross. They have scourging. And then, then you're probably in a state of shock when they nail you to the cross and they drop that down. You're stripped naked. That's the, the spiritual and emotional shame. And you're hanging on the cross. And the only way you can breathe is to pull yourself up on the spikes through your, your feet and your wrists and take a breath and then relax back down. So you don't actually die of the beating or the, the blood loss. You die from exhaustion, suffocation, or, or exposure to the elements. And if at four days you're still alive, those four Roman guards are told that then they can be merciful and they can break your legs so that you cannot pull up Stand up to take a breath. And then they let you expire that way. That was considered an act of mercy. Now, we don't know what these two criminals hanging on either side of Jesus did, but we know that they were serious crimes. And I want you to en envision this. We've done this over the years as Christians. Jesus is carrying his cross and people are mocking him, spitting on him. I mean, picture that. Jesus, the Son of God, the only perfect person, a good, sinless man. And they're hurling insults at him. And Jesus is up on that cross. And I, I will tell you, Jesus did not say this. He did not say, okay, Lord, send down fire from heaven and burn these turkeys up. He didn't say, Lord, push the smite button on your God keyboard and take them all out. That's what I would have said. But what does Jesus say? He looks up into heaven and he says, Father, for forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's what Jesus did say. Verse 39 one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. He's, you can picture that arrogant and pride. He has no need for a Savior, so he thinks. There's no fear of God. And then that other criminal on the other side of him, he rebukes him. He says, don't you fear God? And he says something really interesting. We're under the same sentence. We're all being crucified. And in verse 1, he says, We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. That's interesting that he says that. He knows what he deserves. I'm gonna, I want you to help me uh, do something here. Finish some, some phrases, some common phrases. They're... they're you know, they're ones that, that you'll, you'll know. And just you shout them out loud as we go. Here's the first one. What goes around? Good, good. That was real good. Okay, your past will come back to? Whoa, that sounds like the voice of experience. Uh, let me see. How about this one? You made your bed. Now you must? Right, lie in it. All of those, those little phrases, they all say basically... Uh, the same thing. It's different ways to say you get what you deserve. Yeah, that's a mom thing. You get what you get. That's good. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> now listen, I will tell you something that part of me likes that phrase. You get what you deserve. There's a dark part of me and I think it's part of all of us that, that we like it when someone gets what, what uh, they deserve. You know, um, for instance, you know, I'm driving down the highway under the speed limit. It happens every now and then. And this car goes racing past me. And then a few miles down the road, 
I see him pulled over on the side with, you know. I go, yeah, I do a little victory dance. <laughs> As I drive by, I may even honk the horn and say, hi. Here's, here's a couple examples, a couple videos of instant karma. I love this. Kirsten, wake up. <laughs> See the lights in the back in the little window coming up real fast. Doing 80 and a 65 nearly hits him. Wait, watch, watch behind him now. See the big video? And the lights. Yes! I love that. That is the best feeling, isn't it? Now watch this next one. It's real quick. And there's the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was in Texas, too, by the way. That one was. Yeah. I love it when, when someone gets, you know, what they deserve on the road. Uh, unless it's me. Okay, just, you know, let's be clear about that. Uh, I don't want it to happen. I don't like it when it happens to me. But here's, here's what uh, verse 41 says uh, and, uh, and 42 we are punished justly, the criminal says, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And then he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That to me is an amazing statement by this criminal on the cross. Now Jesus didn't look at him and say, mm, you know what, you're really annoying and you're a schmoozer so no i'm i'm not going to uh, let you come into the kingdom with me today sorry buddy but you you're going to hell you're getting what you deserve jesus didn't say that he didn't say you annoy me and you dress funny he looked at the man and and let me tell you let's talk about this jesus looks at this man this man can't do anything he can't do anything to earn his standing with god can he he can't. He said it to a man who couldn't do anything for God. He couldn't walk the straight and narrow. He's, his feet are nailed to a cross. He, he couldn't perform good works. His hands have spikes in them. He couldn't turn over a new leaf because his very life was ebbing from his body as he said those words to Jesus. He couldn't join a church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't, you know, uh, uh, serve in any capacity. He couldn't do any of those things. This was his last day to live. And he said those, that to Jesus. And Jesus' words to him were in verse 43, Truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. When I think about that, I, sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes I look at that, that's not fair. He didn't get what he deserved. You know those bed, bed what do they call them, uh, deathbed confessions? He lived his life horribly, his whole life. And then at the very end, he says, Father, forgive me. And, and he gets in? That's the difference. But sometimes we say, where's the justice in this? He's guilty. He deserved death. Well, let me tell you what I deserve. I don't deserve to be standing up here in front of you as a pastor, as your preacher, giving a message about this or any other message. I don't deserve to be uh, uh, in a ministry at all. I don't deserve... To have a, a faith family like you all. Because his story is my story. It's your story. His story is just like our lives, our stories. Because we've lied and we've stolen and we've cheated and we've, we've hated people. We've battled with, with bad thoughts and anger and, and lust and shame. When I, when I left my parents' home at 17 to go into the army, I thought, finally, 
You know, I, I, don't, I can finally figure out what's out there on my own. I don't have to go to church. I, I, I don't have to have all these things that are expected of me. I'm just going to live my life and find out what's out there. And I, was, I lived life. I did a lot of stupid things. I, uh, I just did a lot of stupid things. I'm not going to make it a brag. Just trust me. I was bad. And then it got to a point where it was just... There was nothing that really uh, affected me. I wasn't happy with anything. I always wanted more. I was looking for that next thing, whatever it was. And I began to realize that there was guilt within me, and I hated who I had become. And then this uh, lieutenant from the Salvation Army came in looking for musicians to play at his Christmas kettles, and I volunteered and, and went and, and uh, helped at Christmas time. And then I helped on Wednesday nights with his kids' music program. And then he convinced me to start coming to church and playing in his band. And then, and then, and then. And little by little, I realized that I was dead inside because of what I wanted to do. And the guilt, there was no hope and there was no joy and there was no life. It was because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And one of the sermons that, that Danny Vincent preached was on a couple verses in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, and, and here's what it says. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. I want to make sure you understand something. God doesn't make bad people good. That's, that's not what God does. God makes dead people alive. He doesn't make bad people good. Because when I made that commitment and I realized where I was and that, that I was dead inside, I was, I was still struggling with all the stupid things that I did. I was not good, but I was alive. He doesn't make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. And then verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I want you to imagine with me this criminal. Say, say that... That Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. They're not going to be held against you any longer. And the Roman guards hear that. It didn't happen, but say that it does. And they say, well, okay, he's, he's forgiven. So they let him down off the cross. Now he's, he's injured. He's going to carry those wounds with him, but he's going to live. His life has been extended by Jesus. Don't you think that every minute of every day, Every day he wakes up, he's going to remember the sacrifice that someone else made for him. The man who died and set him free. Every single moment of every day, he's going to remember that and he's going to be committed to that. He's going to focus on that. He's going to, to understand that, that he is alive because Jesus set him free. That's my story. I, I need to be there as well. I am just as undeserving as that criminal on the cross. And Jesus was, was killed, was crucified for my sins and for yours. And I think as I, as I go through this, I remember one other verse. And I know there's a lot of guilt in the world today. A lot, of, a lot of guilt in the church, too. That we feel unworthy, unlovable. We feel abandoned. We feel ashamed. But Jesus doesn't say to us, you get what you deserve. Thank God he doesn't say to us that. Because we all deserve the wrath. I'm not here because I'm good. I'm here because he is good. Amen. He doesn't make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. 
And I remember Psalm uh, 103. Listen to this. He, God, does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heaven above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Jesus doesn't look at us and say, you get what you deserve. He says, I took what you deserve and gave you life. Gave you a relationship with my Father. He doesn't make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. He shows us mercy and grace. Mercy, of course, you know, is that we don't get the bad we deserve, just like that criminal on the cross. And grace, grace is that we get the good that we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting the punishment we deserve, and grace is getting the blessings and the good things that we don't deserve. Pray with me. Father, in a world that doesn't understand those words, mercy and grace, in a world where, where we, we try to set up our own camps and, and divide ourselves, we understand that we have much more in common with one another than would separate us from one another. We are all deserving of certain things, and they're not good. But because of you, because you are a good, good father, as we sang earlier, because you are good, we get mercy. We don't get what we deserve, but we also get grace, this gift given to us, a right relationship with your Father, our sins taken from us, and we don't become good people because of that, but we certainly become alive. So help us, Lord, as we go through uh, these weeks leading up to uh, what is probably the most sacred season of the year where we celebrate your birth coming into this, this world, this silent planet as a baby. As we come up upon those days, Lord, remind us continually that we are people of the resurrection, that because of that baby, three years later, we have grace grace and mercy, gifts given to us because of your great love for us and because you are good. Be with us as we go our separate ways. May your word uh, find fertile soil of our hearts to take root in and draw us closer to you. May we share your word, find joy in a world that, that hides it but it's still there, and may our eyes see it and give you glory. Protect us. Keep us all strong and healthy. We thank you for your blessings upon us, and we ask, Lord, that you would keep us safe so that we can come back together in worship next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.